Oops, my tire right in the screen. There, <laughs> there we go. All right, make sure here. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So, to understand Canadian politics at any given time, you have to know two people, the head of the Liberal Party and the head of the Conservative Party. These are the only two parties that have ever run Canada, so statistically speaking, the two guys holding these jobs are the only people who will ever become Prime Minister. I think we all know the head of the Liberal Party pretty well by now, old man Justin Trudeau, who has been Prime Minister since November of 2015, but who is head of the Conservatives? Well, in the years that I have been doing this channel, it has changed quite a few times. When Justin Trudeau was first elected, he beat Stephen Harper, who was the last Conservative Prime Minister. Harper was then followed by Andrew Scheer, who failed to unseat Trudeau when he ran for a second term in 2019. Scheer was then replaced by Aaron O'Toole, who lost to Trudeau when he ran for a third term in 2021. Trudeau now plans to run for a fourth term in 2025. Do you intend on leading the Liberal Party into the next election? Yes. Which, if successful, could potentially make him the longest continuously serving Prime Minister in a hundred years. So the Conservatives are really hoping that the fourth time will be the charm with their latest leader, Pierre Polyev. So, uh, who is Pierre Polyev? Born to a teenage mother in Calgary in 1979, young Pierre was given up for adoption and raised in the city by a French-Canadian couple. He got involved in conservative politics as a teenager and basically never stopped. He dropped out of college and moved to the nation's capital of Ottawa to work for conservative politicians for a while. But not for a long while, because in 2004, at the age of 24, he decided to run for office himself and got elected as the youngest member of the the Canadian Parliament at that time. He actually finished his university degree while serving in the Parliament. In 2006, the Conservatives were elected to power under Stephen Harper, but it was not until 2013 that Polyev got appointed to the Prime Minister's Cabinet. He served in a few different positions until 2015, when the Conservatives were booted out in favour of Justin Trudeau. Pierre, as many of his supporters and critics alike call him, has risen over the course of the last decade or so to become one of the most high-profile politicians in the Conservative Party party, but also one of the more polarizing ones. He is a very intense debater and tends to speak in pretty fierce, uncompromising language. The small businessman wiped out by endless lockdowns by incompetent politicians. These are the people that are standing up and fighting for their livelihoods and their freedom. Why won't the government finally stand with them? Which can obviously come off different ways depending on where you stand. But with conservatives at least, his merciless takedowns of the prime minister and knack for producing violence partisan content have made him something of a rock star, and a few weeks ago he was easily elected head of the party, surprising no one. If anything, people just wondered what took him so long to seek out the top job in the first place. But what, you ask, does the man stand for? What does he believe? Why does he want to be Prime Minister? Rather than attempt to answer these questions myself, I thought it might be more revealing if we went straight to the source. Which way should I put it like this? All right. All right. So. Into the field of battle we go. Yeah. So thank you so much for making time. Happy to. You are now the fourth conservative leader tasked with the assignment of unseating Justin Trudeau. I was just curious, why were you picked by the party? And what do you represent in terms of a different direction for the party? Well, I think people wanted uh, someone who would uh, give them back control of their lives. My message of smaller government, bigger citizens, appealed to a lot of people, especially young people. Um, uh, they also wanted someone who would fight back against uh, Trudeau and his ideology rather than just backing down all the time. And uh, that uh, combination, I think, uh, allowed me to, to sign up 312,000 members, which is, uh, I think, a record for any leadership candidate in the history of Canada, and also to win uh, about 70% of the vote nationwide. Um, so that, 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 uh, that is the reason and that is the result. Is it fair to say that you are more conservative than the previous leaders? I don't know if I would say, I don't know if I would put it in that term. Um, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to measure these things, right? It's yeah. a subjective measurement. But the, what's, people know where I stand. Yeah. And uh, I, I tried my best to make clear my policy positions on everything uh, during the leadership race so that folks would be able to judge me and vote for me accordingly. And apparently I was in line with their thoughts uh, as they exercised their vote. Mm. 
When I was reviewing your biography, one thing that was interesting to me was just how young you were when you got sort of politically involved. Yes. When you were a teenager, basically, possibly even younger than that. And I was just sort of wondering, you know, because we're not too far apart in age. Yeah. And I was just sort of thinking, like, in the early 2000s, when you would have been getting sort of politically activated, what do you remember as being like the big issues that kind of like really animated you in those days? Um, at the time, it was the national debt because uh, the, in the 90s, the government was on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, I, think the, I think it was the Wall Street Journal had called Canada a third world, world basket case. The IMF was worry, uh, worried that we might default. Uh, bond markets were refusing to lend to Canada. Um, and now I didn't fully understand all of that yeah. technicality, but I just knew that as a 16 year old that I was going to be stuck with this debt. Yeah. And I thought it was fundamentally unfair that people were voting uh, away my future earnings um, through uh, by borrowing and, and piling up this debt uh, that our, our generation would absorb. And so that, that's what most animated me at the time. And I wanted to basically have the freedom to make my own decisions with my own life, my own money. And uh, so it was the basically idea of giving every individual the freedom to make to, to, to pursue their own goals. And uh, that basically is what I stand for today. So not a lot has changed. Never had a, uh, a left-wing phase. No, I mean, it's funny. I, I started getting interested in politics when I was around 15 or 16 because I had injured my shoulder and I couldn't participate in high school sports anymore. I couldn't play. Uh, I, couldn't, I was in uh, amateur wrestling and things like that. I wouldn't, wasn't able to do that. I, I'd earlier hurt my back, so I couldn't play football. So I basically was looking for something to do, and I started reading these books. And the first one I actually read was on Fidel Castro, believe it or not. Yeah. And, um, so I, I didn't really render a judgment on him one way or another. I just read the book and then started reading other books. And as I charted my path through all, these, all this literature, I just concluded that the answer was to let people make their own decisions be masters of their own destiny, and uh, and that's how I ended up as a conservative. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I do think of you and sort of the office that you hold now as being a sort of reflection of kind of the post-COVID era of Canadian politics in the sense that your message and the way you talk about freedom and this sort of thing has a particular resonance, I think, in the post-COVID era yeah. that maybe it wouldn't have had in a different political era. And I'm just wondering, like, when you think of the COVID era, what are your sort of conclusions you draw from it? Well, look, COVID was a, a serious illness and it did take lives. Uh, that said, a lot of politicians took advantage of it for, uh, to expand their own power. I mean, it's almost undeniable now. One of the first things Trudeau did when, he, when COVID happened is try to pass a law giving him unmitigated power to raise any tax to any level at any time for any reason without parliamentary approval, which is unprecedented in our system. Um, he brought in the censorship laws and they, they imposed this ridiculous and unscientific vaccine mandate. Um, and they basically saw COVID as a, in the words of Christia Freeland, a political opportunity to massively uh, expand the state and diminish the citizen. Um, my, I think I represent pushback against that. Uh, I'm standing for the citizen who wants to take back control of their lives. And I think that's why my campaign was so resonant. Mm. So I've heard it, you sort of characterized as being the candidate of choice of the truckers, right? And what does that mean? Look, uh, the vast majority of the truckers who came to Parliament Hill peacefully protested. Um, the irony was they didn't come here to asking for anything. Yeah. They just wanted to be left alone. Yeah. Um, they, they were working, they called heroes for two years by taking our goods and services across borders without a vaccine. And it was thought completely safe for them to do that. And all of a sudden, as the rest of the world was beginning to lift all mandates, Trudeau brought in a brand new one on this group of people who were the least likely to spread any virus because they're in a truck mm -hmm. alone all day. Mm -hmm. And so these people lose their jobs. They say, well, we're going to go to Ottawa and protest. Um, and they, they came here, held a protest. I think if Trudeau had gone and sat down with them for 15 minutes and tried to find some solution, they probably would have gone because they were without income, sleeping in a truck in the middle of February, I think it was. So um, I just fundamentally thought it was unfair that these working class people who'd been kicked around for two years and all they wanted to do was just go and earn a paycheck in an already tough job uh, were being deprived of their earnings and their freedom. So that's why I was happy to stand up for those law-abiding and peaceful truckers 
who were protesting for their livelihoods and liberties. We all condemn anyone who broke laws, block it, blocked borders, or behaved badly. But the vast, vast majority of the, the protesters were peaceful and just wanted to be left alone. And that's why I supported those particular people. Mm -hmm. So, election is set for 2025. What are you going to run on? Can you give me some of your top promises? Well, uh, paycheck power, really. I mean, right now, people's paychecks are, uh, are being savaged by inflation. Um, the share of, you know, let's just go through the examples. Um, the share of your paycheck that it takes to own and pay bills on the average house um, is at a record high. So it takes like, for the average pay paycheck, you have to spend about 60% of it in a month just to, own, to pay bills on the average house. That's a record. So when it comes to turning your paycheck into a house, uh, your page, it's weaker than ever before. Turning your paycheck into food, well, food prices are up 11% year over year, fastest pace in 40 years. So uh, your paycheck has lost the power to feed you. And uh, the paycheck has lost the power to uh, buy energy, which is necessary for modern human life. So basically, I'm the only candidate that will restore the pay purchasing power of people's paychecks and savings by uh, reversing the inflationary policies of this current government. Right now, you've got uh, a government that uh, the cost of government is driving up the cost of living, uh, half a trillion dollars of inflationary deficits, um, bidding up the price of goods and interest rates, and that means that people have less left over. Bigger government means smaller citizens. I'm going to control government so that people have more powerful paychecks and they can their dollar goes further. Okay. This might sound like a bit of a softball question, but I am sort of curious about it. You sort of alluded to before that you're doing well with young people, which the polls do suggest is the case. And yeah. that is something that is sort of against the stereotype of conservatives. And again, without this seeming like too much of a softball, yeah. what is sort of your theory of why that is? Well, I think it's because when we're young, uh, when people are young, they are uh, adventurous and ambitious and excited about d d taking on the world, doing whether it means um, enjoying a, an exciting social life or buying a house and starting a family. Either way, those things have been under attack by big bossy government. For two years, young people weren't able to go to the gym, go to the bar, go to a nightclub, go on, on a vacation, go backpacking. So they felt like they lost that uh, sense of personal adventure that is d deeply ingrained in, in the human spirit at that age. And then the ambition of like, I'm gonna start a family and buy a house and raise a kid or kids. Uh, these things are now impossible. Like in your city, it's just like physically impossible to buy a house for 95% of young people, which seems like it's, it, it, we've now become desensitized to that, but it's insane. Like this was not the Canada that you and I grew up in. We were kids. Everyone knew that if you got a decent job, you could have a house. And you can't take control of your life if you don't have a home. You, you, you can't build up credit history, collateral, um, savings for your eventual retirement in the form of home equity. And of course, you can't raise kids in your parents' basement or in a 500 square foot apartment. So um, people see in me the opportunity because I'm going to knock down the gatekeepers and allow more home building, stop the money printing that has inflated housing prices. The, the opportunity that one day home ownership uh, will be possible for them again. And that uh, sense of um, that taking back control of their lives has inspired a lot of young people to join my campaign. What is the biggest misconception about you? Uh, I don't know. I don't, talk, don't know. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what conceptions people have. So uh, I'd have to uh, I'd have to reflect on that. You must yeah. have some sense of, of like sort of unfair characterizations of you that are floating out there. Or ones that you disagree with, you know? Well, I, I think just overall, right now, the, 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 the major misconception is that the, the parties of the so-called left are, we're told that they care desperately about the, the downtrodden, but whereas conservatives do not. The, ans the obvious, uh, that's obviously false because all the policies that they pr pursue are, are making the gap between rich and poor even worse and are hardest on the lowest income people who don't have the ability to shield themselves from the effects of inflation. So I think, you know, for me, I think I am the champion of the little guy, the underdog, 
uh, who wants just the chance to work hard and be measured by merit. Um, whereas I think the other parties are really the party of the aristocracy, of, um, of those who have and therefore who can benefit as in everything inflates. If you have lots of stuff and stuff inflates in price, then you're wealthier. If you have little then, and, and, you need to, and you need stuff, well, when, when inflation happens, you're, those, that stuff is out of reach. So really the party, and my ideology is really one of, uh, of meritocracy, not aristocracy, and letting people get ahead through their own hard work rather than their ancestral wealth or uh, their, 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 their privilege that they've had because of their place in, uh, in, the, in the system. An issue that is of particular interest to my audience, the political issue that I probably spend the most time talking about on my channel, is Bill C-11. Yes. Obviously, major Trudeau government initiative. Just wanted to give you a chance to state clearly where you stand on it. Against. Against. Why? Because it's government control of what we see and say, and say on the internet. Uh, basically, they want to give the CRTC the ability to manipulate social media algorithms to favor and that by definition uh, necessity disfavor. Uh, s social media content. Um, those algorithms are designed to feed people what they want to see. I mean, uh, and let's, I'm, not, I'm not naive about it, the social media companies do that because that keeps their uh, more eyeballs on their platforms, which means more advertising revenues for their bottom line. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, for, for the viewers, they see what they want right now. And uh, under this proposed law, they'd see what the government wants. Um, I think that's wrong and I think it's dangerous. Um, I think that what will happen is uh, that not only will political interference necessarily follow, but uh, those with corporate lobbyists will have the ability to influence the CRTC, which is the, the body that will oversee this new law, to favor them. So we, we will see you know, big broadcasting corporations will send their lobbyists daily to the CRTC and say, can you adjust the algorithm just a, bit, a little bit like this and a little bit like that uh, in order to pump the, their content and of course their, their advertising. And then smaller players who don't have lobbyists and can't uh, influence the bureaucracy uh, will then be pushed down. Because it is, it is a zero sum game. The viewer online only has so much time to re look at internet content, and if they're if they're forced to watch A more, well, then they'll have less time to watch B. And if A is all of the big, well lobbied for broadcasting corporations, then that means that people like yourself will then have fewer viewers because I, I mean they 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 will tell you that they're going to give you a fair shake as well. But let's be honest, you don't have a lobbyist in Ottawa, yeah. so you're not going to be able to constantly work uh, the system. Uh, whereas, um, of course, uh, Chorus and Bell and other large broadcasting corporations will will be able to outmuscle you in, uh, in politics in a way that they weren't able to uh, in audience popularity. Mr. Leader, thank you so much. Good for to your be time. with you. Welcome Fantastic. to Ottawa. Thank you, sir. And I uh, hope you enjoy your time in the capital. And we're done. Yes, we are done. These. Interviews are always a little intimidating for me, you know, I'm not used to uh, talking to politicians in their own offices in these kind of very intimate settings, particularly with real big shots like the, the guy who could be the next Prime Minister. But you kind of get a sense of who he is and what he stands for and what he's all about and, and definitely the way that he talks, you know, the way that he, he speaks I think is one of his primary characteristics. You know, he speaks in this very confident, sort of fast-paced, very assertive way which I think, you know, is going to be a big part of how he proceeds to pitch himself to, uh, to voters in the next uh, election. So, anyway, you guys can tell me what you think about that interview, how you think it went, how Pierre came off, what you think of him. Leave your comments in the thing below, and I will see you next week. Very good, JJ. <laughs>